want to welcome yeah. everyone to AppSciCon 2019. This year's theme is Understanding and Enabling the Search for Life on Worlds Near and Far, which is a critical step in answering the age-old question, are we alone in the universe? On our planet, we've discovered microbes deep under the ice in Antarctica. In extremely hot environments, at hydrothermal vents under the ocean. And in the driest deserts we could imagine. It's incredibly difficult to find a place on Earth where life cannot survive. But that's just one data point, and we're headed to another. The newly announced Artemis program will lead us back to the moon as a stepping stone to a critical astrobiology target, Mars. NASA's search for life in the solar system wouldn't exist without you, our incredibly diverse and hardworking community of astrobiologists. The important science you all do on our planet helps look for life on Mars and other worlds like Jupiter's moon Europa or Saturn's moons Enceladus and Titan. It takes everyone from all over with diverse backgrounds working together to bring new questions, insights and discoveries. NASA prides itself on celebrating inclusion and diversity. And speaking of pride, June is Pride Month. In honor of Pride Month, we especially want to recognize the extraordinary work of our LGBTQIA scientists. Again, thank you for all the hard work you do. Have a great week. Um, I just wanted to let you know that both Thomas and Lori actually really wanted to be here this year. They realized that there was going to be an exciting meeting with lots of important discoveries and they spent the time in their busy schedules to make this introductory video to welcome you to the meeting and, and show their appreciation. So. Uh, anyway, um, that's starting us off. We have a really tightly packed hour. The agenda kept getting filled even more and more in the last few hours. Um, but we're going to start out with a report from the principal investigator for the SAM instrument on Curiosity. Everybody's been hearing the buzz about methane. Did they measure it? Is it high? Is there life? Uh, what's the story? And so we have. Um, Paul Mahaffey here to tell us what, what exactly is going on. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. It's been a pretty uh, exciting last few days, I must say. Um, in five minutes, I'm going to give you the history of methane on Mars, uh, <laughs> which started off a few years ago, actually, with um, uh, Earth-based sensing when plumes were reported from Mauna Kea uh, infrared spectroscopy. And uh, so when we proposed the, uh, the SAM experiment on the, on the Curiosity rover, the mass spectrometer down in that region uh, has uh, noise, background contamination. Uh, and so we invited Chris Webster to put a tunable laser spectrometer on SAM. Tunable laser spectrometer is a nice small device where light bounces back between two mirrors. And for a very small device, you get like many meters of path length and great sensitivity. So we got to the surface of Mars. Uh, the ground-based observations had been controversial, to say the least. And so we were going to go to Mars and, and, uh, and understand whether it was really there or not. It turned out it was still controversial. But uh, remember the date, June 15, uh, 2013. It was after we'd landed, after we'd made a few measurements. And they were kind of close to zero uh, within, the, within the noise of being zero. On June 15, 2013, uh, we saw a higher value, six parts per billion. That was interesting. It rapidly went away. That was uh, Mars year 31. You start Mars year counting from 1955, I guess. Uh, Mars year 32 in the northern spring, something really interesting. Uh, we saw a period of about four months where methane came up kind of between six and nine-ish parts per billion. We made four measurements over two months, and then it went away again. Uh, Mars year 33 in uh, northern autumn. Uh, going into winter, again, we saw another value, uh, six parts per billion, which went away. Uh, and then really nothing in direct measurements in Mars year uh, 34. But in the meantime, what we had developed uh, was basically using a device we had developed to enrich noble gases on Mars to pull out xenon and such. 
Uh, we use that basically, uh, Charles Molespin, who's here, spent days in the lab uh, developing it, basically sucking the atmosphere uh, through these enrichment cells, scrubbing out the carbon dioxide, and basically enriching the methane in the tunable laser spectrometer by a factor of about 25. And we did that over multiple Mars years. We have about 10 points, Mars years 31, 32, 33, and 34. And those measurements were all below one part per billion between 0.2 and 0.6, and they kind of showed a seasonal variation. Uh, but we had never seen uh, enhanced methane, or methane plume, or spike, or whatever you want to call it, uh, with the enrichment experiment until last week. Uh, so the, this run was run uh, Wednesday uh, in the middle of the night, and then on Thursday we got the data back, and uh, Chris Webster's words were incredible and dumbfounded, and we were surprised. We saw 21 parts per billion, the highest we'd ever seen uh, in the enrichment mode, which was really interesting. So uh, that's a story uh, which rapidly somehow made its way to the New York Times, and uh, we decided anyway, with great help from Ashwin, we would scrap the weekend plan and make that run again. And we did make the run again. The data came, just came back. And in fact, the methane plume went away. It's, we measured it both with direct and with enrichment. It's back down now to below one part per billion, so kind of consistent with, with what we've seen all along. But just a couple things to note. Uh, I asked you to remember that date, uh, June 15 because uh, the day after that, uh, Mars Express planetary Fourier spectrometer had flown over Gale Crater, and they were using it in a mode where basically they stared at Gale Crater, uh, quite complicated, but basically summing up hundreds of, of spectra, and they found what amounted to, in their paper, 46 tons of methane in an area that was kind of 250 kilometers by 250 kilometers, including Gale Crater. And so that was really fascinating. And other measurements before and after that where we had seen zero uh, methane, uh, they didn't see any as well. So that was very interesting. Uh, and they published that on, on April 1. You should never publish a methane paper on, on April 1, I guess. Um, so that's the story. Um, uh, a plume came and a plume went. We're, we're very confident of the, of the measurement. And I should say that uh, both Mars Express and Trace Gas Orbiter, which to date has not seen methane, although it only senses down to a few kilometers above the surface, uh, we're coordinating with them and we're, we're very happy to uh, make coordinated measurements and so on. So that's the long and the short story of the history of methane on Mars. So don't leave just yet. So, um, we're willing to entertain maybe a couple of questions just for clarification. Otherwise, find, um, buy you a drink maybe? Sure. Find Paul at the poster session and buy him a drink. Does anybody have any quick clarification questions? Okay. Thank you, Paul. Okay. Oh, how do I advance? Yep. This? Yep, yep. okay. Um, okay, so we're going to take the first part of, t of tonight's town hall to talk a little bit about all of the programs in the astrobiology program that have uh, solicitation calls out and one for the future to let you guys know a little bit about the history in terms of what have been the selection rates, what have been the proposal pressures, and um, and what sort of things that we've been funding. And fortunately, all of the program officers for all of those programs are here tonight, with the exception of uh, Becky McCauley. Um, she's home working on the next generation of astrobiologists and could not travel to the meeting. So we're going to start off with talking about exobiology, the granddaddy of the astrobiology program. Hi, uh, I'm Lindsay Hayes. I am now the, the lead, the caucus lead for the exobiology program. Um, so for In Roses 18, um, a couple changes that we had in the exobiology program, we moved from the sort of step one, step two process to the NOI step two process. Um, and we've also moved the due date from October to May. So this is in the last round of, uh, of Roses. In that round, we had 156 proposals submitted. Um, 24 were selected for funding. 21 of those were fully selected. We had 
a partially selected one, a conditionally funded one, um, as well as one that was funded through sort of general RNA funds uh, because it was sort of between the exobiology and the emerging worlds programs. Um, we had a selection rate of 15.3 for this program for last year. Uh, this year, for ROSE's 19, we had a move the, the, the due date for the selection or for the um, submission. Uh, the due date was six uh, was June 13th, so a little bit more than a week ago, um, and we received 158 proposals. Good job being consistent, community. Um, I'm, we're looking forward to working through those. Um, there will be a bit of a delay in terms of when we're able to get the selections out. Uh, because of a sort of pile up of, um, of reviews uh, due to the, the shutdown and the moving of due dates across a number of different ROSES programs. So uh, we're committed to getting responses to you guys as soon as we can, uh, but we appreciate your patience ahead of time. So in terms of the sort of history, uh, you may be familiar with a slide that looks a lot like this being presented by by Michael in the past. Uh, this one's been, of course, updated for the last two selections. Um, you can see the number of proposals has sort of gone up over the years. It's sort of uh, remaining very consistent. Uh, the selection rate, we've had our ups and downs. Um, and so this is sort of how we've gone over the next couple of the past couple years. Um, remember in 2012, we did not have um, a call. So that's where that missing data point or set of data points are. And then uh, finally, to give you just a little bit of an idea of the distribution of funded tasks, this is how uh, it breaks down in sort of the different aspects of, um, of the exobiology program. So um, this is sort of based on the award amounts, not necessarily just this, the total number of awards within each of those. Uh, this is biosignatures and life elsewhere in the sort of dark blue, um, evolution of advanced life in the whitish, uh, early evolution of life in the biosphere in that sort of dark uh, black, dark, dark purple. Um, Large-scale environmental change in macroevolution is the small purple wedge, um, and prebiotic evolution is that teal wedge. Um, you can see the difference between the sort of awards that we're continuing this year, uh, which is roughly two years of funding, and the new awards. Um, we currently also fund eight NESF awards, uh, which will this year be replaced by the Future Investigators in NASA Earth and Space Science and Technology, or FINEST program. Um, and we also cover uh, one early career fellow who has received startup funding. Um, we note there is no early career fellowship program in ROSA 17 or 18 that is planned to be replaced by the early career awards uh, program, which uh, will come out this year. So. Sure. Um, the, the major difference between the Early Career uh, Fellowship and the Early Career Awards is that for the Early Career Awards, you will be asked to, uh, it will be limited to folks who have already received an award from a ROSES program. So um, almost any of the ROSES uh, programs are eligible. Once you have uh, received the award, you are then eligible to apply for the Early Career Awards program. We have extended the period that is considered early career from seven years to 10 years post PhD. Um, and we've allowed for, um, with permission, uh, certain things are considered um uh, certain things involving family problems or you know other things like that are considered reasons for sort of extending that a little bit beyond. Uh, you can find all that information in ROSES um, and, and find out also uh, the contact for that is Shoshana Wider um, and you can contact her for more information about that kind of thing. So, any questions? Okay, uh, you guys, there's a lot coming up, so I'm glad you guys are with us and moving through quickly. Yeah, Brittany. Um, the, the, I think the, the, what, sorry, when is Finest going to be announced? Um, the goal, I believe, is at the end of this month or early next month, so. Do you have the, 27th. June 27th? June 27th. Okay. June 27th is the current target date. Um, even though the selections or the submissions were due late this year, we you know we gave some some leniency because of the shutdown. Uh, our goal is still to get them out in in time to get funding uh, for the fall semester for students. Any other questions? Okay, thank you guys very much. Uh, okay, I am Mitch Schulte. I'm the lead of the caucus for Habitable Worlds. Uh, so just a couple of quick slides on Habitable Worlds. Uh, the most recent call that we have data for for Habitable Worlds is from Rose's 2018. As many of you know, it's I think it's the last call uh, for the Rose's cycle in planetary science. So um, everything is sort of a little bit lagged for Habitable Worlds. Um, for the most recent one, which was 18, the step ones were due in November. 
Uh, the step twos were originally due in the middle of the government shutdown, and so because of the shutdown, uh, the due date for the full proposals was moved until the earliest possible date allowed by Thomas Zerbuchen, which was the 29th of March. Uh, so we got on the order of 65 proposals. I don't remember the exact number. That, it's somewhere between 60 and 70. I don't remember the exact number off the top of my head, which is why 65 is there. Um, and so we are uh, currently working on uh, the evaluation process for those proposals. Uh, we're targeting to have announcements for those sometime late summer, early fall. I don't know the exact date yet, but uh, stay tuned for that. Um, so for the ROSES 2017, again, which is the most recent year we have data for, there were 46 proposals, so we've had an increase in the number of submissions. Uh, out of the 46, uh, we selected eight, which is a 17.4% selection rate. Uh, seven were fully selected, one was partially selected, um, and one we selected that was actually funded by the Heliophysics Division. As many of you know, Habitable Worlds is what's considered to be a cross-disciplinary program. So we involve astrophysics and heliophysics uh, in that process, and they were actually excited about one of the proposals that we got in Hab Worlds. And so they, select, they were actually able to fund that, so uh, great thanks to them for doing that. Uh, currently, we have 21 active grants in the program. Uh, three of those are NESF awards, which are soon to be the finest awards. Um, and we expect to be able to select uh, maybe one or two finest from the uh, recent batch of them that will be announced apparently next week. Uh, so here are the data for um, Habitable Worlds. As you all know, this program um, just began in Rose's year 2014. Uh, and so you see uh, by solicitation year on the x-axis uh, with the number of proposals on the y-axis on the left-hand side and the selection rate uh, on the y-axis on the right-hand side. Uh, so number of proposals has gone down over the years, although it's come back up again uh, this year. So uh, great for you guys for submitting more proposals. Uh, and then the selection rate has remained fairly steady, uh, somewhere between 15 and 20 percent. And we expect that to continue. And I think that's the last slide I have. <laughs> oh, and we are always looking for reviewers for the program, so if anyone would like to volunteer uh, for Exobiology 2, and Lindsay's raising her hand, uh, so if you are interested in volunteering, uh, please uh, send me an email. You can find my contact information on all the NASA web pages that have uh, information about the program. It does build character, as Michael's pointed out. So, and it is a very good experience, especially for early career people who like to get uh, some practice and understand what reviewers look for in proposals. So, uh, great idea to sign up to volunteer. So, let us know. Uh, anybody have any questions? They're stunned into silence. I love it. Okay. Yeah. I think. Well, I think you were very nice, Mitch. I was going to say, if you want to ask us any questions, we're taking names for reviewers. <laughs> so. All right, I'm going to wrap up with, um, well, I'm going to talk about two remaining programs that are related to astrobiology and then discuss our new program. So I'm one of the leads for the Planetary Science and Technology through Analog Research Program, PSTAR. Um, it was, as you may r uh, remember before, it's the follow-on to ASTEP. Uh, NASA is always evolving in terms of the research that we solicit in response to what we need for our missions and how the um, the uh, science in the fields evolve. And so PSTAR um, came out around the same time as the reorganization and looks for, as it describes, um, taking science and technology out into the field and analog environments and um, preparing for the, as ASTEP did, the exploration of planetary environments. So in ROSES 18, it was not solicited due to a lack of funding. Um, I'm sure you're, um, uh, may, perhaps you may be a little alarmed by the low selection rates, 
Um, we have a lot of really great things that are going on in planetary, wonderful missions, uh, lots of continuing rovers that don't seem to ever want to break, um, and uh, <laughs> which is fantastic. Um, and of course, the cost of science is going up, and that's not being necessarily matched by the amount of funding uh, that we're getting. And so we're doing the. We just want you to know we're doing the best job that we can. We don't want to waste anybody's time. So P Star decided when there really wasn't enough funding to make uh, more than maybe an eight uh, percent selection rate that it wasn't even worth soliciting. So uh, the year before that, the, and it is solicited this year, so we're back. But in ROSA 17, we got 61 step one proposals. Um, 11 of them were discouraged. It's a program that is, is really important to understand, and that's why I'm describing it a little bit more than the other ones, and that is that there are three components to it. There's science, technology, and science operations, and you must be uh, show fidelity to two of those in order to be relevant. And so um, if it's just taking an instrument out to kind of test it, that doesn't belong there. If it's developing an instrument, we have other programs for that. Uh, and so it's actually a very, it fills a very special niche. Uh, we had six proposals that were selected that year. Four were related to Mars exploration, two related to icy worlds, and one was selectable for the Mars exploration program. It was very much related to testing um, an aspect of an instrument that's going to be flown on Mars 2020, but um, in the end we didn't have funds to select it, and the selection rate for this program is 12.8%. Uh, you can see basically what our portfolio looks like. We have 17 active grants. We have a NESF award, which is really great. We had a graduate student um, associated with some of the work that's being done in these analog environments. And as Lindsay mentioned, that's being replaced by Finest. So all of you that have successfully, and I must say, we are probably one of the most um, engaged and proactive of the disciplines in planetary in submitting proposals to get support for your graduate students. So uh, keep it up. That's really great. All right, here's the history of P-STAR. Um, it's been sort of pretty steady. Uh, and again, it started right around the time of the major reorganization in planetary sciences. I also want to mention Planetary Protection Research Program has had kind of a um, an unsteady or uh, inconsistent past. We're trying to get that on track. That's being led by Becky McCulley, who I mentioned couldn't make it. Uh, here today, um, or this week, unfortunately. So ROSA's 17 selections were made last September, and they're basically going to be solicited on a biannual trend with a May due date. Again, I, I report on this even though it's a separate program because many of you that are involved in, um, in astrobiology are interested in the technology and research that needs to be done to prepare missions to, um, to be clean enough and to make un the least ambiguous measurements possible as we uh, search for life on other planets. And so this is definitely related to our community and we hope that all of you now that it's gotten back on a regular schedule will consider uh, proposing to this, this program. In ROSA 17, 14 proposals were submitted, five proposals were selected for funding, two fully and three partial funding, and the selection rate was 35% or 36%. So this is a good place to go uh, if this is a place, uh, if this is the kind of research um, that you're interested in, it's a little bit more applied or it has, it has an, uh, an application that's important to exploration, so consider that. All right. And this is the wild up and downs of uh, planetary protection research. <laughs> and so we're hoping to, to show in the future um, a, a steadier um, uh, cadence for the program and, and a, a, a consistent investment in the research. So many of you are really interested, I'm hoping, in, well, first of all, I just want to put a, have a shout out for the NASA Astrobiology Institute and the fact that we're celebrating 20 years of amazing science. That organization is completely responsible for us being here today, for building the community, for having one of the most vibrant early career community I've ever seen in my entire life. Um, that makes the, the excitement at this meeting so amazing and, and uh, attendance so desirable, I think, by many people. Anybody that's introduced to this comes back always the next time. And so we have two sessions, to, um, full sessions tomorrow. I want to make sure that you guys know about that to celebrate the accomplishments. 
Um, it was originally established um, to start to really bring researchers together to do interdisciplinary research. And after 20 years, it's a resounding success. As I mentioned, we have a fantastic community. We get amazing proposals. We're really moving things forward. And so then we're looking forward to the, the next step and um, what's going to follow on the success of, of the NEI are the astrobiology program research coordination networks, which you're going to hear about in a second. But um, I, I would say that the NEI did many, many important things, and I want to assure you that we're, th we're uh, the plans in the future to take care of all of those. Of course, they were tremendous in supporting early career researchers. That will continue. But two very important things were, one was coordinating the community. As I said, I think before the beginning of the NEI 20 years ago, there were many disciplines that were involved in astrobiology research, and they were multidisciplinary in nature to describe our program. So there was some biologists working here, some astronomers that had something to contribute, but the Astrobiology Institute brought these people together. And we started having truly interdisciplinary uh, research programs come out of that. <clears throat> so that coordination of researchers is essential, and the job isn't done, that needs to be continued. And so what, what is happening in the future future with the RCNs is we're looking to not only coordinate ourselves, because that's basically, it took 20 years, I think, for us to get um, well coordinated, and now we need to start reaching out and interacting with the sister uh, divisions in SMD, because uh, astrobiology and the search for life beyond Earth really encompasses all division. It's, it's actually one of the three focuses um, for the, all of the Science Mission Directorate. And in order to really accomplish that, we have to start working with researchers from those other divisions. And that's one of the reasons that at least one of our colleagues, um, Doug Hudgens, is here. He's down here in the front in the red, very easy to spot an astrophysicist that uh, is responsible for exoplanet research uh, in the agency. Um, and so to facilitate that, we have the RCNs, which we're going to talk about in a second, but most people, most people are most important to them is thinking about where the funding is going to come from. And so um, the other thing that the NAI did, it, was, it provides stable support for five years for large teams with uh, fairly large budgets, so between a million to two million a year for five years. Um, I think that it's, it's very clear that that kind of funding is essential for some research prob uh, problems in astrobiology, and so the portfolio of funding will continue to be, the, there'll be opportunities for single researchers to get single investigator awards, as well as these multi or interdisciplinary projects that can be funded at a larger scale. So the new program is called ICAR. I wanted it to be I care, but people thought that was too corny but I do care. Um, and it stands for Interdisciplinary Consortia for Astrobiology Research. Um, the details are here. And I should actually mention to you, the slides that we're showing tonight were part of a presentation um, that was made to CAPS, the Committee on Astrobiology and Planetary Science. It's the standing subcommittee of the Space Studies Board at the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. Uh, it's featured online, so you can actually find it if you go to their past meetings and look for presentations. So any of this stuff you can find if you want to consult it for any of the information about the programs or this description. So the, the proposals that are, we're looking for in ICAR should describe an interdisciplinary approach to a single compelling question in astrobiology. It can address a single science strategy goal or several science strategy goals um, uh, together. Um, a step one proposal is required. And that step one proposal is binding. Um, we do this, again, I'm very much in favor of um, not wasting your time, letting you know if it's what we're looking for, if you hit the mark. And so there'll be a, f a five page proposal, pre proposal basically due for the step one. Um, and we will make a decision to encourage or discourage those proposals. Just so that you know, there's no ideal size of an ICAR team. The scope, but the key to, the, to these proposals are the scope of the research and the resources that you request, whether it be people or money, should, um, should in general be larger than what is typically considered in a research op, uh, a ROSES call for the other program elements, otherwise you should go to exobiology. 
or you should go to habitable worlds. So we expect them to be larger than that. And as always, you know, for those of you that have reviewed, you ask for what you need. And, um, and, and if it long as it, it match, it's the right size, it's the right amount. They're expected to uh, cost about 600,000 to 1,000, uh, or to, a, well, 600,000 to a million uh, dollars per year. They'll last for five years. And the whole point of ICAR is to feed uh, into the RCNs. So proposals to this program element that are awarded and funding will become, automatically become members of the newly established uh, astrobiology RCNs. In terms of men membership beyond that, so the RCNs are now um, not just teams that are selected from this solicitation, but teams are that are selected, or proposals that are selected from all participating programs. So that's every single program in astrobiology, it's Picasso and Matisse, which are, you know, so it's what you've just heard from, it's Planetary Protection, P-Star, EXO, HAB Worlds. Um, it's going to be <clears throat> open to technology, so Picasso and Matisse. Um, it, it's going to include calls from other um, divisions as well. And you'll have the opportunity to self-select for uh, membership to, to, the, to these uh, networks. So that's the funding part of it. The, for this year, um, the areas that we're going to solicit for are three of the RCNs. One is Nexus for Exoplanet System Science. Uh, that's the oldest of the RCN. The second one is Prebiotic Chemistry in Early Earth Environments, PCE3. And the third one is From Early Cells to Multicellularity. Uh, this RCN has not been established yet, but part of the establishment is going to be the solicitation of proposals in this particular area. Uh, for the other RCNs, you'll notice that people are wearing ribbons, ask me about Nexus, ask me about PCE3. Nexus is yellow. Yep, is yellow, PC3 is orange, now the ocean worlds is blue, and Enfold is green for life. Um, and so please, after, you're going to hear from them now. In fact, actually, you guys want to think about coming on up here soon. Um, but uh, you can be sure to, that, please feel free to ask them anytime you see them during the rest of the week. This is the timeline. The, um, so there's a placeholder that came out to let people know that this was coming. You may have gotten that. If you didn't get the notification, then you're not signed up for notifications in Inspires, and you should, because that's where um, that's the way people learn about the latest, greatest that's happening uh, in uh, Rose's calls. The actual official announcement will come out July 30th, on or about. The step one proposals will be due September 26th, and the step two proposals will be due January 7th in 2020. And then we hope to process them relatively quickly and make um, awards very in that first quarter of, of 2020. If you want more information about anything that we've talked about here or about ICAR in particular, we spent a lot of time last fall when this was being decided and we were transitioning and rolling out the RCNs. So there's an astrobiology program FAQ. It's about 23 pages of frequently asked questions. Um, that you asked, that we asked, that everyone asked us. Um, if you don't find your answer there, please contact us and you'll likely get your name on the Hall of Fame of new FAQs because we want to keep letting people know what's going on. Um, and so, again, you can look there for some of this. I also just want to, before I talk about the RCNs in particular, just want to call out the, the astrobiology postdoctoral program. I said we're still committed to early career development and training, and it will continue. It has, it's part of the program, and it's related to any um, funded proposal and any of the programs that astrobiology supports. And so um, it's available to P PIs that, uh, that uh, received proposals or, or funded proposals from Hab Worlds, from Exobiology, from ICAR. Um, those will be the opportunities that uh, postdocs can apply to, and that will continue. And just to let you know, since 2000, we've had 108 PhDs or postdocs, scientists, and engineers that have been <coughs> supported. And uh, there's a little bit about the history of it began, and, and then it expanded in 2010. And, um, it will continue to go on. It's a very important part of our program and keeps it really vibrant. 
Okay, so um, before I actually get into this, I'm just gonna ask Michael. So, um, come up, come up. So I listed him as an emeritus. Um, so this is an opportunity for you all to say, bye, we missed you, but you're glad, we're glad you're, he's here at this meeting. So let's give him a. And in your new role. Hmm? In your new role. My new role, yes. So hi. Some of you may remember me. Not too long ago, I uh, was the program officer for exobiology, and longer ago than that, I was the program officer for ASTID. Um, I have moved on, uh, not very far though. So I'm currently the deputy associate administrator for research in science mission directorate. That means I'm broadly responsible for uh, policies and processes for all SMD solicitations, both grants and uh, AOs. So if you see me at a review or something like that, that means something's gone really pear-shaped now. Um, the subtitle of my job is, my, is keeping Thomas Zerbuchen, the SMD Associate Administrator, out of jail. So now you know what I do most days. Um, I just wanted to mention three things that are going on at the SMD level above the astrobiology program level, above the planetary science or astrophysics division level that I think will be interesting to you. So the first is some of you may know that a couple of years, like two years ago, a year and a half ago, we started asking our reviewers to comment on whether they thought the proposals they were seeing constituted proposals of high intellectual risk and high potential impact. Now by intellectual risk, we were talking about, um, we weren't talking about whether it, the experiments would work or not. Um, Thomas Zerbuchen likes to describe intellectual risk as reputational risk. You know, you submit an idea that could get you laughed out of your job, basically. What we found was surprisingly, I have to admit, about 10% of our proposals that we were getting across all of SMD were considered high risk, high impact. Um, more interestingly and more surprisingly, uh, high impact, high risk proposals were selected at a rate of about 35%. The selection rate across all of SMD for all of the ROSES programs is about 24%. So clearly, the culture of our reviewers is such that we are evaluating well and soliciting, and, and sorry, selecting high impact, high risk proposals. But we can't just pat ourselves on the back because, as I said, only about 10% of the proposals we receive are high risk and high impact, which means that there are probably a lot more high risk, high impact ideas germinating in your heads out there than we ever see. So one of the things we are working on at the SMD level is to try to fix that, not fix it, but improve it. So we are right now, I mean literally like last week, uh, discussing how to encourage more high risk, high impact proposals to be submitted, how to better evaluate them, and how to encourage their selection. So stay tuned, um, nothing has been set in stone yet. The, some of the considerations though are we don't want to increase the workload on you proposers, on you reviewers, and on ourselves as program officers. So don't expect some giant new thing. It will most likely be a, an adaptation of current processes. But stay tuned, we'll be talking a lot more about it once we figure out what we're gonna be talking about. So the, the, the second thing I'd like to talk a little bit about is something that astrobiology, the astrobiology community has down, which is interdisciplinary research. So astrobiology is fundamentally interdisciplinary. It's been called the transdiscipline even. Um, a lot of the rest of what SMD has done historically has not been so interdisciplinary. Thomas Zerbuchen is very interested in both inter interdisciplinary research and research that cuts across divisional stovepipes. So the recent movement toward an all SMD version of the Exoplanet Research Program, led by Doug and Steve Reinhardt and Melissa Morris 
at Martin Still, um, is part of that. That will be cutting across, ultimately, all four divisions, trying to find the best proposals related to exoplanet science that also satisfy other divisional goals. But that's only like one thing, right? So we are in the process of beginning, of talking about other opportunities. Sometimes there are cross-cutting science goals. So the MAVEN mission, which is looking at atmospheric escape from Mars, uh, has direct implications for some exoplanet science and also addresses some goals that the heliophysics division would have liked to have seen done on Earth and elsewhere. So there are those kinds of cross-cutting synergies, but then there's also instances where you just want to throw an instrument on somebody else's spacecraft. So if you were here on Sunday and went through the Exopag, you might have heard somebody talking about wanting to put a telescope on the back of some planetary spacecraft that's going pretty far out there in order to turn around, take a look, and measure zodiacal light, our own zodiacal light. So that's another category of interdivisional work. Over the next year or so, we're going to be at SMD thinking really hard about how to, to do this and probably asking a lot of questions. This may culminate in trying to get the National Academies to do a sort of decadal survey of decadal surveys kind of thing, uh, looking for these synergies and cross-cutting themes. Uh, that's not set in stone yet but it is something we are talking about. The third and final thing I'd like to talk about briefly is uh, issue, um, efforts we're making at SMD for uh, in, in, to increase our diversity, inclusion, and accessibility of our programs. And the flip side of that, of course, is unfortunately anti-harassment and anti-discrimination. We've been doing a lot of that work in the last two years, and I. I Talk to me if you'd like to hear more details. The one thing I do want to say is we've, one of the things we've looked at is the composition of uh, competed mission science teams over the last 10 or 15 years. And we are trying to make that easier to broaden participation. So we had, a, in November last year, we had an initial toe dip. We had a workshop on PI diversity, which uh, surfaced a number of issues that led to some of the actions we've taken. Uh, another one of the things we've discovered is that unless you're at a gateway institution, so uh, a NASA center, JPL, APL, SWERI, LASP, places like that, you may never have been exposed to mission culture, to mission terminology. You may have no idea what it takes to go from a cocktail napkin to a piece of metal flying in orbit around Jupiter. And so we've started developing training programs for people. First thing we did was, mm, I guess it was like four weeks ago, we did a two and a half hour telecom, te two and a half hour telecast webcast from University of Colorado, where most of it was Thomas Zerbuchen and a little bit of me um, talking about statistically what we know about our, uh, our, our PIs and their teams and anecdotally what we know from Thomas's experience on five proposals, I think. Um, it's online and I, I recommend if you're interested in maybe one day becoming a PI of a mission, you take a look at it. The other thing, we're, next thing we're doing is we are working with uh, Dr. Erica Hamden from the uh, University of Arizona and the Heising Simons Foundation, and we're going to be putting on a two and a half day workshop in, I think it's, it's in the fall, October, November. Um, two and a half days to talk about going from a basic science question to what the next steps are. It'll be more interactive. There'll be some networking uh, opportunities and so on. We have a uh, mailing list that's been set up. Um, and uh, we'll be announcing when and where and how and what soon. Um, we're not opening up uh, applications for this yet because we are in the process of hiring a STEM equity expert to help us uh, make sure we have a deep and broad reach into the science community. So those are some things that we're working on at the SMD level. Um, 
I'm really happy to be back amongst my people. Um, if you have questions, just either ask them now or bother me later today or the rest of the week. I should be here the whole week. Thanks. Okay, um, we're gonna take some time to have the, uh, one of the leads from each of the RCNs that have been established to talk about exactly what they are. Here are the RCN Olympic rings. Uh, and we're gonna start it off with Nexus, the oldest of the RCNs. They're there. Okay. All right, so um, Nexus is going first because we were kind of the prototype of this research coordination network and we've been around for um, over three years, so I will go very quickly because we don't have a lot of time left. Um, but what is Nexus? We're an interdisciplinary research coordination network. We're specifically put together to um, have an interdisciplinary focus on exoplanets and understanding what we can do when we get different disciplines across SMD uh, to work together um, on understanding the planet. Obviously the planet forms, it evolves, it interacts with its star, interacts with other planets in the system. Very much uh, to understand that, you need to understand a lot from um, the different divisions at SMD. We have about 34 PIs at the moment in Nexus, and they are selected from a range of programs going from the former NAI all the way through to uh, sort of XRP type proposals, smaller proposals. So small and large, mixed together, uh, but all working together. So what we do in Nexus is we, um, you know, we're a group of PIs. Uh, we uh, do our own research that's funded under our respective programs, but we also come together to try and think of really important things that we can do as a community of researchers um, to advance our science um, and to potentially put products and things out there that we need. So I won't go through these slides in detail, but just to say that we have sort of a series of goals um, which we try to meet, and I'll try and highlight specific things that we've done there that are Nexus activities. So if we go to two developed programs for existing space telescopes and for NASA facilities, that's something we obviously want to do, tying into to the NASA missions. Uh, one of our, our uh, uh, activities was to put together an early release science proposal by the community. It had massive participation uh, from the Nexus Consortium and also from international collaborators. Uh, we were able to win about 23% of the total allotted um, early release science time from JWST with that large collaborative effort that was sparked and uh, organized by Nexus. Um, we've also, uh, our, our team members, um, you know, work on their science and have input to the, the mission concept, so we impact it there. And I think one of the, the most important activities that we've done is something that was led by Sean and Nikki and Nancy Kiang. Um, is this uh, biosignatures workshop that we put together where we again brought disciplines together in an in-person and remote workshop. It, we put the work back into workshop and that workshop resulted in six seminal papers that sort of surveyed the entire field and thought about new directions. Um, and those biosignature papers then fed into the NES decadal reviews um, and also had an impact there as well. So that's kind of an example of the sort of things that we can do um, as a community when we take the time to notice only do our research, but also look out to the community and think about community-focused activities uh, that we can do to advance our research. So I will hand over to our one of our siblings. Oh, uh, yes, sorry, there's also posters on all of the RCNs, um, and they're at the back of the poster hall. So if you want to learn more about the individual RCNs and what we're doing, there's loads more stats and info on those posters, and you have time to look at those um, at leisure. Uh, if you want to learn anything about Nexus, just find someone with a yellow ribbon and ask them about Nexus. <laughs> All right, so in fold in three minutes, the network for life detection. This is the second RCN that's been rolled out. Our idea is to be a multi-institution research coordination network focused on developing technologies and techniques for life detection on other worlds. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of my co-leads, Tori Holler and Brittany Schmidt, who are here. Um, we have Lindsay, who is somewhere, uh, who's our NASA headquarters representative on Infold. We have a steering committee. These are 
PIs of Relevant Roses proposals, EXO, Hub Worlds, PSTAR, Matisse, and Picasso that have been invited by headquarters to, to join the steering committee. The membership is involving the co-investigators and collaborators on the lead and steering committee projects. And participation is active engagement with the broader community of life detection researchers and technologists. And I'll talk about some of our activities here in a second. But first, wanted to recognize our steering committee members. So these were folks that um, were invited to join shortly after the shutdown. We've had two in-person steering, uh, sorry, two virtual steering committee meetings and we'll have an in-person one tomorrow. 23 members, and you can see we cover this wide array of, of different disciplines, folks working on exoplanets, Mars, Earth, ocean worlds, a lot of mission participants as well, as well as this whole array of different, you know, specific disciplines of study. Uh, the core objectives that we've outlined so far, first, to collaborate to investigate life detection strategies, including biosignature creation and preservation. Second, to facilitate work between scientists and engineers to develop technologies and tools. Third, to actively and inclusively engage the scientific community. Next, to cultivate interdisciplinary and multi-organizational initiatives. This, I think, is also really important, organizing reference standards and helping define life detection standards, uh, coordinating community engagement with the ladder of life detection, incorporating ideas of agnostic biosignatures and different features of assessment and confidence, working with missions, because, of course, we want to translate all of these great concepts to actual missions for life detection, and then cross-cutting training and education. And just want to say we these just to outline some of our early activities. We've got a website. You should visit it early and often. It's quickly evolving. It's um, www.infold.org. You can find the steering committee and project profiles there. This is a place we hope to be able to post a lot of upcoming events. We've got a Twitter handle. Haven't tweeted yet, but it will be at Life Detection. Um, and also, we've got a contact us page, and we've been taking that really seriously. We've had dozens of people indicate an interest in becoming involved in, in full white papers and working groups, and we're keeping tabs of all of that. So if you're, whether you're an early career person or somebody who's been working in life detection for 30 years, you know, please don't hesitate to, to fill out that form so we know that you're interested in becoming engaged. We've also got, it's a very beta version at this point, but a map of field work locations to help facilitate coordination and sample sharing open to everybody in the community, uh, a job posting forum that we've already started up. So if you've got jobs that are related to life detection, please just let us know. We'd be more than happy to advertise them. We've been working on as workshops and working groups that are going to be important for us. The grayness of life workshop, this idea of looking between prebiotic biosignatures and what we think of as traditional biosignatures is going to be one of our first infold workshops, looking at October timeline hosted by the Santa Fe Institute. We'll have other virtual and in-person workshops to follow. We're spinning up a, a few working groups here. You can see some of the early ones listed. Um, something not to be missed, Tori Holler and, and everybody else that's been involved in the Life Detection Forum project will be having an event on Thursday night, 5.30 in the Larch Room. Please don't, don't, don't hesitate to come along. We're going to actually be engaging with a demo of how this new web-based platform can work. And finally, an infold social activity. Please come. Anyone that's interested in becoming involved and infold in our activities will be at Henry's Bar and Tavern across the street right after the Life Detection Forum event. Thanks. Detecting organics. Yeah, detecting organics. <laughs> Great, so I'm the third child and also the third RCN. I don't know if you guys did that on purpose. Uh, this is Prebiotic Chemistry and Early Earth Environments Consortium. It's a mouthful. Uh, we have recently gotten started. We just, a couple of months ago, put our steering committee together. Um, let me tell you first what our science goal is. Um, and we spent about three months on this, and I think we debate it every other day, so feel free to change it. It's to investigate the delivery, synthesis, and fate of small molecules under the conditions of the early Earth, which we probably still need to figure out, um, and the subsequent or maybe concomitant formation of protobiological molecules and pathways that lead to systems harboring the potential for life. Um, how we do that is to 
um, sort of break ourselves up or at least overlap ourselves into seven, several, seven different themes. Um, so to sort of get to that particular, particular goal, we're looking at planetary evolution, surface evolution, chemical constraints, inventories, um, specific environments, right? Because not every uh, single piece of the planet looks the same all the time. And then the stability of small molecules and their um, evolution into prebiotic complexity. Um, if you would like to learn a little more about how we break these seven themes down into sort of specific disciplines and topics and who's working on what, that's all on our poster. So come see our poster. It has this lovely purple and orange theme, so you can't miss it. Um, and I won't take a lot of time going through the objectives, um, but how we get to this goal um, is not just to look at those science themes, but also sort of start to break down some of the barriers and, um, and get the group talking, right? And so theme number one is to integrate um, uh, the early earth and prebiotic chemistry community. So we're going to bring everyone together and make sure we all speak the same language. Um, we'd like to develop a robust and fully parameterized model of the early Earth, so you know, give us 30 years and several more zeros and commas after the funding. We can probably do that. Um, <laughs> but once we do that, I think we'll be able to really conduct some novel and innovative um, experiments and sort of theoretical models of how pre prebiotic chemistry um, could and could not have worked on the early Earth. Um, that will help us to identify the conditions, not just on Earth, but maybe elsewhere where prebiotic chemistry can happen and where it might sort of not happen where it can't happen um, that might save us from looking in places that are not sort of worth looking at. Um, and then to characterize the geochemical and geophysical constraints of early Earth environments um, so we can sort of move on with future experimental and theoretical prebiotic chemistries. So that's the objectives. I have like three minutes total and I think I'm probably over. So I want to get to the good stuff. On the left of your screen, screen, you see the cat herders. That's my uh, co-leads, myself, Lauren Williams, Ram Krishnamurthy, and Tim Lyons. Uh, Lauren and Tim are here. Um, and then on the right, our steering committee, sometimes the cats, and together we all, um, we get together and try and sort of build this community. But I would suggest that um, a lot of you in the audience are really part of this community, so we encourage you to come and join us um, and, and build on our ideas. Um, if you you're on the right-hand side of this, by the way, and you don't still understand what PCE3 is, I suggest you come to 13 Coins on Tuesday for happy hour. Um, if any of you out there are not on the steering committee and you want to come have great ideas and tell us what we should and shouldn't do as part of PCE3, you should come write it on a napkin at happy hour on Tuesday. Uh, if you would like to be put to work on any of those, you can come, on, come to our Wednesday brown bag lunch um, in the Madrona room at 12.15, bring your lunch, and we will see you there. Thank you. Uh, representing the fourth uh, and very new uh, Ocean Worlds is the network for Ocean Worlds, and the, the time for this network is now. Um, the, uh, I'm one of the co-leads uh, with Alyssa Roden and Chris German. We have been working on the concept for uh, this network in the last couple of months, and uh, the overarching theme is developing science and technology research for exploring ocean worlds. And we think that ocean worlds research is really guiding the search for life beyond Earth, and particularly in three key areas, geophysics, ocean systems, and life. And the uh, geophysics is uh, focused on looking at evolution of ice-covered ocean worlds and processes that are occurring at the boundaries. Ocean systems are are focused in habitability and the sustenance of life through time. Um, the life areas are in resource exchange, energy generation, and the signs of life. Um, all three of these have uh, a theme in, that we are emphasizing in, in terms of looking at comparative studies between um, amongst the ocean worlds and including Earth. And there is a a uh, real emphasis in, um, in this uh, research coordination network on integrating scientists and cross-fertilizing between the Earth Sciences Division and the Planetary Sciences. 
um, in, in all three areas here, looking at the different boundaries between the uh, ice-ocean interface and the ocean-sediment interface, um, we think are relevant for geophysics, um, understanding what's happening for the ocean dynamics and life. The objectives that we have are five, um, which are to identify and stimulate novel directions of inquiry through enhanced communication um, within the PI community of scientists that are involved and engaged in ocean worlds, both in Earth and planetary sciences, pursuing activities that both reveal and address critical knowledge gaps in ocean worlds research, um, and workshops around this uh, we're planning to organize. Um, stimulating and facilitating new ocean worlds collaborations to undertake high impact transdisciplinary research. Um, also identifying and integrating research on Earth and other ocean worlds to really catalyze synergistic studies um, that identify the conditions and the potential for life to exist. Um, and if you saw Chris German's talk, I think that's a, a strong emphasis there. Um, the last is to cultivate and augment the training of the next generation of ocean worlds researchers. The metrics of success that we have are four. Um, one is really um, evidence that we have stimulated new research coordinations that result in new proposals being submitted that are traceable to the activities uh, that we've organized. The second is influencing now, um, the influence of now disseminated information to things like the planning of the next decadal survey. Uh, the third is expansion of the ocean world's community. Um, we really want to engage the people who are doing remote sensing on Earth and uh, studying the cryosphere on Earth and, and see if we can bring and engage and train this community to thinking about ocean worlds out in the solar system. Uh, and the fourth is the incorporation of now expertise into future flight missions uh, such as the Europa Clipper. The who's invited, uh, you, you might be going, hey, they haven't invited me yet. And um, <laughs> that is because we uh, are sort of, uh, the, our coming out is today, and <laughs> uh, the, um, we, we haven't extended really many invitations at all yet. But those people, um, teams that are funded and engaged in Ocean Worlds research uh, are going to be invited, and those are in programs um, that have been introduced this evening, but include the Habitable Worlds, Solar System Workings, uh, Casino Data, an data analysis program, PSTAR, Exobiology, Picasso, Matisse. Um, and at the bottom, we have the Earth Sciences Division, where there are several programs in cryosphere science, oceanography, ocean biology, biogeochemistry. Uh, and really, together, we hope that this program will really wind up developing a vision for the future and future of what ocean worlds research will really look like. And we have a new website that just uh, is active as of uh, early this morning that is uh, oceanworlds.space. So please come and uh, visit it and uh, often. Thanks. So I'm sorry for the packed evening, but I would like to spend a little bit of time letting people ask questions. So the leads are staying up here, I'm up here. There are also the program officers that are sitting at the table down in front. So are there any questions? There are mics there. <laughs> Hi, Mary. <laughs> uh, Kevin Head, JPL. Uh, th th this, is, this is great, um, but ultimately when it comes to missions, we've got, uh, all of the AGs around NASA, the, the OPAG, the MEPAG, the VEXAG, the XAG, XOPAG, everybody here know, right? So, so we all sort of divide up geographically. And these AGs then generate their white papers and their priorities for the, the decadal surveys. Astrobiology, in my opinion, and in the opinion of many of the folks here, really got hit hard in the last decadal survey in terms of being spread across this sort of geography of the way NASA does its planning. To that end, I think looking forward, we need an astrobiology assessment group. We've got to break the mold on how we're actually doing our planning for the decadal survey and our prioritization of missions. So I'd love to just, well, thanks. Um, <laughs> If you want missions, AGs are the way to get them done. Um, and, uh, and if you want missions, the AGs feed into the decadal survey. And that's, uh, if you want to learn more about that, I'm happy to 
let you buy me a beer so I can cry into it about the Europa Lander. <laughs> um, so in any case, Mary, you and I have talked about this in the past. Can we get an astrobiology assessment group going? Did I hear an answer out there? <laughs> Michael, was that you? No. <laughs> okay. Um, so you and I have chatted about this, and I don't think it's a good idea. And it's because I think we need to be integrated into the planetary science, and I think we need to be integrated into all these ags, and I don't think we need to be isolated. You know, we don't need to <laughs> take it out back. Um, I, I'm really concerned that in the past when we've done decadal surveys and it wasn't integrated and it was a, its own little section, there ended up being a chapter on astrobiology and not a discussion of astrobiology in relationship to missions. And so I'm concerned, I, I would like to see, and I've been trying to work towards um, infiltrating and integrating and making sure that astrobiologists actually w w attend ag meetings, get their voices heard. One of the requirements for the um, new RCNs is, a, a, well, a requirement, a request is to ensure that members from these RCN actually attend uh, ag meetings and play a more active role. Um, I think that that's Again, working together to get the missions that you want seem much better to me than um, the antagonism that I would say the current ag sometimes had again, uh, with outer planets versus Mars versus Venus versus things to the moon. I think that we actually transcend almost all of those groups and that's the way I think we should, should do it. So I would say that I think we need to all work harder to get our voices heard in the, in the strongest groups that develop actually full-on missions because there's a lot of people in astrobiology that aren't at institutes um, that are developing missions, that aren't part of current missions, that have a lot to contribute. Um, and so I worry that, that they need to be included as well. When's the last time you went to OPAG? I went two years ago. Yeah, well, I'm not the one that should be speaking for it, but yeah. when was the last time Allison went? Uh, September. September. Yeah. I mean, it's you guys that need to be talking at that. Um, and, and so, and, and again, I can't travel everywhere, but I'd be happy to. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're doing this community a real disservice by not having a mechanism to better feed into these ags, even if we do not have our oh, own ags. I agree entirely that we need a better mechanism for feeding in. I don't think actually letting us meet and talking to ourselves is the way to do it, I guess is what I, and so I'd like, there's gotta be something in between what we have now and separating ourselves out and coming up with our own um, white papers. So I think this is a really good discussion um, for the RCNs, for other people in the community um, to find a better way. I don't think anybody disagrees that we're not feeding in well enough. Thanks. Yep. Um, so on a similar note, I just want to remind everyone that in addition to the AGS, these decadal surveys are ongoing. Um, the astrophysics one is still taking white papers for the Astro 2020 uh, programs part of their call, so not the science white papers, but the programs. And, and to follow up on something I just heard Mary saying, if we want our science as astrobiologists included in these missions, especially at the, the Cato survey prioritized level. It's incumbent upon us as individuals to write white papers, participate in those white papers, get involved in the ags where appropriate, and when asked to serve on the panel, serve on the panels for the Cato surveys. That's how it's gonna happen. You know, we, we have to prioritize our science just like every other community. Um, so, you know, get after it, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Sorry. There's not a question there. I'm just trying to <laughs> apologize for that. Get off that soapbox. I just wanted to follow up uh, the National Academies. Um, oh, goodness. The committee that had astrobiology, astrobiology strategy. strategy. It was like 17 words long. I can never remember it. But we did just come out um, with a bunch of recommendations, and one of them was that um, everyone should always consider that astrobiology should be incorporated into every mission. Sort of that's how NASA should go forward, is thinking that astrobiology should be one of the fundamental things that gets thought about when developing missions. And so that's, that's sort of already there. Um, how we do it in or outside of an ag, I'm agnostic on. Um, but I, I think it's, it's out there and the community came together and said that part really loudly. 
It's like, you okay. <laughs> Apparently, it's like hot potato chairs up here. I don't know how to answer questions. Somebody asked one question. I'm not sure who's going next. What's up? <laughs> I'm, sorry. I'm, just, I'm wondering who's going next. <laughs> uh, mine was related to eggs. If yours isn't related to eggs, I could say it very quickly. Go ahead. Okay, uh, I was just gonna also follow up on that. So for those people who aren't aware of the assessment group structure that generally informs NASA about mission priorities, um, right now there's a growing number of them. Um, there's probably going to be a new Mercury one, potentially. Um, so there's a lot of questions as to how, um, whether it's better to divide or, or to um, get together as, as different parts of the community in terms of advising NASA directly. But right now there's MEPAG, VEXAG, and uh, OPEG and SBEG that all operate in the Planetary Science Division um, to offer uh, strategies. I know EXOPAG as well um, kind of operates between both um, um, astrophysics, I think more inside of astrophysics. Um, but two things to, to take note of is that the Astro and the OPAG committee, we worked very, very hard to make sure that we got astrobiologists, card-carrying astrobiologists, onto the organizing committee for OPAG. Um, and so that now includes people who I will probably forget, as well as Morgan Cable um, and Jeff Bowman. Um, Morgan, who's an astrobiologist right here. Jeff, who's an oceanographer um, and a microbiologist. And so that that represented OPAG actually making an investment in this direction. The roadmap for Ocean Worlds is another place where we have tried to help prioritize outer planets missions or at least the synergizing Ocean World science into those priorities. But these are examples of, mission, of meetings that everyone should participate in. If you can't come in person, they're available over the phone. You can participate um, in the telecons and in the activities. And they're very, very important because they're where we discuss priorities as as different parts of the community and advise NASA on directions and for forward motion. And the other thing I wanted to highlight that in the uh, Exopeg meeting that Vicki ran this afternoon, or uh, sorry, Sunday afternoon, um, there was a discussion of a joint meeting between Exopeg, VEXAG, and OPAG that may happen in the future. Um, that's really important because it's an example of AGs working together to synergize and to make the group smaller rather than more divisive. And so I would highly suggest that everyone become a participant in that. In Enfold, we'll be really focusing on white papers to contribute to the planetary decadal. And now I'll shut up. Sorry. I also want to just add something that um, there's the Committee on Astrobiology and Planetary Sciences. That's an ad advisory committee that's at the National Academy, and they are responsible for making recommendations of the organization of the next decadal survey. Um, the co chair is Chris House, who's here at this meeting. Um, I can't think of other members that might be here, but that's a good place for you to voice your concerns too about how astrobiology is considered in, um, uh, in decadal surveys. Mary, you yeah. mentioned, this is Jenna Hold Eigenbrod. Uh, Can I, oh, sorry. sorry, go ahead. Just, uh, just one other thing to speak about the exopeg. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm Doug Hudgens. I am the program scientist for the Exoplanet Program at NASA headquarters and in the Astrophysics Division. And I just wanted to jump on, you, you mentioned the Exopag, which does, which is coordinated out of the Astrophysics Division. So it might be sometimes transparent to you all here in, in this community. I want to encourage you to, uh, to, if you Google Exopag and go to the Exopag page, you can sign up for our email exploder that announces things, in particular, talking about the executive committee of the Exopag. Every year, around about January, we put out a call, a, a dear colleague letter to the community, uh, soliciting uh, people to nominate themselves or nominate others to serve on the executive committee of, uh, of the Exopag. And we would welcome, uh, uh, welcome nominations from, from this community. We certainly are trying to represent the breadth of the exoplanet exploration stakeholder community, which certainly includes astrobiology. So I encourage you to, uh, uh, to try and link in uh, because we would welcome your contribution. Who's your current chair? What's that? Who's your current chair? Oh, <laughs> sorry. Our current chair is right here. <laughs> Vicki. An astrobiologist. Sorry about that. <laughs> an astrobiologist. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> Thank you, Doug. Uh, Jenna Eigenbro, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, I wanted to kind of add another element to the discussion that's going on. And Mary, you, you mentioned a very important word, and that was integration. Essentially, we've got two communities. 
and they've kind of evolved in their own pathways. The AGs representing more of the mission-related people doing what they've done. And then we've got the astrobiology, which has really got a foundation in a lot of academic research. And we need to blend the two together. That's what we're talking about doing. So you've heard the folks from the mission side saying, hey, we want you all to get involved in the AGs. You do. You need to do that if you want to see the, the science that you have uh, developed here on Earth take foot in a mission somewhere else. But the same token, we need to reach out to the planetary scientists and the other people who are in SMD doing mission work and get them involved in all of these groups. So some of us aren't necessarily on one of the proposals, aren't actually funded through astrobiology, but we might be doing it. So I'm not sure what the avenue is for that, but I would just encourage that all of these groups reach out to as many of the people that they can who are involved in missions to get involved and share their knowledge so that we can all work together because ultimately the missions need the astrobiologists and the astrobiologists need the missions. They go hand in hand. So the integration has to come from both directions, not just this group doing something else. Uh, hi, this is Bill Diamond from the SETI Institute. So at the risk of um, taking on too much intellectual risk, uh, I have a question about the RCNs and, and how they're going to work or how they do work. Uh, one of the attributes, as I understand it, of, of the NAI was, was a core administrative function, if you will, that, whose purpose was to kind of bring together the different NAI teams and do the cross-pollination of ideas and exchanges of information, et cetera. Uh, in the new structure with the ICARS, how is that going to work in terms of you'll have different teams? Is there going to be a mechanism or infrastructure for sort of the coordination and communication between those teams? Sorry, Bill, just to clarify, do you mean the constituent teams of a given RCN, or do you mean between the RCNs? Uh, the, within an RCN. Within so, an RCN. Yeah, for example, yeah. the, 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 okay. the astrobiology, um, so what, what is going to take the place now of the NAI? So for Nexus, we have some experience with this. Yeah, we have uh, you know, all of our PIs from these different programs. It's very much, much bottom-up. So, um, so the management at the top, of which I am one of the members, we're sort of the cat herders, but we hold meetings for the steering group uh, to come together and to decide what's important to them and what activities they would like to support and to have that discussion. And so the ideas really do come grassroots from the PIs and from the people who are interested in that science, and then we help enable whatever they come up with. So, so that is the way that works. So instead of a sort of more top-down structure, it's very much the community figuring out what the community wants, and then making sure there's enough infrastructure there to actually enable it and make it happen. And in terms of, of that steering committee facilitating that process, is this something you do on an annual basis or quarterly basis, or what, um, is there a... Uh, steering group meetings, I mean, depends on the RCN. It can be on a monthly basis. Uh, so, you know, on, on that sort of a time scale, it's not, it's not annual. Okay. It's, it's more frequently than that. Yeah. And the leads meet weekly. Yeah, the, the, uh -huh. the, we, meet, we meet weekly to, okay. to go over issues for the, for the group. And they meet monthly with the point of contact at headquarters. So Nexus meets with me and Doug Hudgens. Um, and then there's a plan. So um, Nexus is the oldest one. Then Enfold yeah. came on about a year ago. And the last two just happened starting before the shutdown, slowed down a bit, and then picked up again. And so the plan, too, is when all of them are online and the steering committee knows, everybody knows what's going on, there's going to be quarterly to buy um, semi-annual meetings of all of the, the leads and then an annual meeting of all of the people that are part of the RCNs, either at something like Astro, uh, at AppSicon or another alternate meeting. So those things that kind of bubble up bottoms up mm -hmm. then still get disseminated, you know, ultimately um, kind of by the steering committees. At, I'm, at, I'm sorry, what was the last part? They bubble up and do what? Well, if, if so, so you've got this, the, the coordination and communication, you, you talked about it happening you know, bottoms up instead of top down, but then ultimately this information is, is getting to the steering committee, it's discussed in these monthly meetings, et cetera, and then you know, sort of the outcome of that or the output of So they're of not the providing any advice. They're coming up with ideas of activities for the community beyond themselves. Uh -huh. And they're um, 
larger representation. So instead of maybe one geophysicist on a, a small committee, there are 34 people that study exoplanets that are coming up with ideas are uh, representatives from the community because they also have their team members to bring forward ideas for, I mean, they talked about organizing white papers. They talked about um, Nexus has had five, four, four workshops um, since it started. Um, these are all activities that serve the rest of the community. So the ideas, instead of coming from me or coming, or Lindsay, are coming from the community. Great, thank you, that's helpful, mm -hmm. thanks. Hi, this is Dave Diemer right here. I just want to make a little bit of a historical comment about the importance of NAI, the importance of the MAGs, uh, AGs, in this case MEPAG, and starting back in the 90s. Of course, the Astrobiology Institute started in 1997. The MEPAG effort really got going in the 90s also. And uh, this was an important period where the Mars exploration rovers were being developed but hadn't landed yet, and we had to um, decide just what this uh, Mars Science Laboratory mission was going to be all about, the Curiosity rover. <clears throat> and um, that was about that in the 90s was when I was involved with MEPAG. And uh, because of the Astrobiology Institute, several of us in the astrobiology community made a point of attending these MEPAG meetings, which were quite frequent at that time and frankly led up to determining who would be selected for science definition teams. And to make a long story short, because of our participation in MEPAG, Curiosity became a rover instead of a fixed lander. It was the astrobiology input through MEPAG to those teams that made it a rover. And we had to win that argument before the Mars rovers landed, the Spirit and Opportunity landed. So we hadn't seen the wonderful things yet, and we still had to win that argument. So this is a real impact, and I would suggest, in the, as NAI is now being succeeded by these new organizations, that there be travel fund, that these groups make sure that they support travel to these AGs. You just have to be there. To, and then you make a difference. Astrobiology is important. The first few of you who go to these are going to be really uh, standouts because there's not you're not well represented, which means they want you to be involved in things because they know that astrobiology is part of what sells missions. And so I would just want to say there's demonstrated impact in the past. There's good reason to expect that if there's a mechanism for supporting attendance at these things, that you're going to have impact in the future. Dave, thank you so much for that comment. I'll also say that the strategy that, that was delivered from the study that the National Academy did pointed out that the mechanism for getting astrobiology into these missions needed help and needed some creative um, uh, energy put towards figuring out how to do that best. So it's, it's re a recognized issue, and we certainly know, thank you for your hard work as in MEPAG and all of you that mm -hmm. attend these AGs. It's really important. Good evening, Sanjay Sum, Blue Marble Space. Um, so the, the NAI fostered a, a community of foreign institutions that enabled and validated astrobiology research in foreign countries, um, particularly uh, South America and Asia. And I was wondering how these, uh, this network will continue in the RCN uh, future of astrobiology. So the uh, arrange the uh, partnerships between um, foreign entities and the astrobiology program were um, uh, curated by the NAI. The actual agreements are between headquarters and these entities. Um, and um, it, particularly for the ones that resulted in um, um, tangible um, activities that supported the research for NASA and the education for, um, uh, for training, um, continued beyond that initial impetus and there is no reason why they won't continue afterwards. I think they're going to be handled a little bit differently. I think there's going to be more rigorous evaluation of um, who we enter into an agreement. That's a request from the Office of uh, Interagency and International Relations and they'll be um, established and review on a regular uh, basis so they don't, you know, they, they sunset. So that, that's the intent for the future. Thank you. Jason Rorkin, NASA Goddard. Um, just as, a, so I know scheduling is really hard. And so, but we need to do a better job of, um, of trying to uh, 
inform the AGs of when they can meet. Uh, so for example, today was SBAG and tomorrow. So I'll bet you that there won't be a whole lot of astrobiology input in this meeting. Very good point. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'm Ron Turner. I'm the senior science advisor to the NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts Program, and I just wanted everybody to be aware that there's another way that you can explore, you know, these creative ideas that may ha make a difference in astrobiology, and it's a program run out of the Space Technology Mission Director at NIAC. I'm going to be around most of the week. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to catch me. Thanks. Hello, Justin Lawrence, uh, Georgia Tech. I had a Sort of specific question about roses. There was an email that went out a couple weeks ago about the inclusion of Antarctic field work back in solar systems workings, solar system workings. And I was wondering if that would apply to other programs like PSTAR, et cetera, or sort of what the nature of the NSF NASA relationship is currently uh, down south. I'm sorry, I actually didn't get what you were. What did you say again? There's an email oh. about three weeks ago about Antarctic field work being included back in solar systems workings. Um, we're actually testing the, the relationship between. Um, actually, Michael can even speak to this. The relationship between uh, NASA and NSF has um, had some issues about who's, you know, we're, fortunately, we're not one government. Um, and we operate very differently. And so uh, we're waiting to see if this new, um, new, the most recent run at collaboration with NSF actually will work for um, solar system workings. And then we'll consider um, there have, yeah, we'll consider expanding it to other programs. Sounds good. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Can, can I make one last final comment? Um, oh. If people want to get more involved as astrobiologists in the Astro 2020 um, effort, just be aware that on the ExoPag website, we have a, uh, a spreadsheet where people can put the ideas and things they're interested in working on and solicit uh, co-signers and co-authors. So if you as an astrobiologist would like to contribute to something or even come up with your own white paper, that is totally fine. Um, that resource is there if you'd like to go shopping for participation. Okay, thank you all. All right. Go to the posters. <laughs>